Hey everybody, welcome to the presentation today, uh, symposium by Greg Glasgow uh, under the name of Science Fiction for Science Policy, Science Fiction as, eth as an Ethical Learning Device for Students and Policymakers. That starts at 9 a.m. So thank you guys for coming to the first round uh, at 9 in the morning. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay, yeah. So my name is Greg Glasgow, and my project is titled Science Fiction as an Ethical Learning Device for Students and Policymakers. So I'm going to start off uh, with an outline. I'm gonna, just going to define ethics and science fiction, um, go through the historical and political significance, um, give an introduction to the project itself, talk about some modern relevance of science fiction, uh, talk about uh, academia and technology and what academia has to say about technological development, um, go into the teaching portion of the project, and then reflect on some including, uh, concluding thoughts. Um, so what are ethics and how do we teach ethics? So ethics we can kind of define as the study of concepts involving uh, good, right, duty, obligation, virtue, freedom, uh, rationality, and choice. And that's like a very condensed version of the Oxford Dictionary of Ethics. Um, and teaching ethics, uh, well, there's kind of uh, the problem that I want to approach in my project, which is how do we teach ethics to STEM students in an engaging and impactful way? Um, so when we teach ethics, we don't really just say uh, this is right or wrong uh, in ethics classes. It's, it's an active debate and discussion. So learning ethics is very much intertwined with the process of coming to the conclusions rather than uh, the conclusions themselves. And this is an important side note that we're going to come back to later. Uh, so what is science fiction? Um, so it is fiction that contains an imagined future, uh, scientific or technological advances, major social or environmental changes, time travel, life on other planets, that sort of thing. Again, that's from the Oxford Dictionary. And then I added some images that I think people associate with science fiction. So the historical and political significance of science fiction. Um, so ethics have been taught uh, and discussed for over 2,400 years. For reference, uh, Socrates passed away in 398 BC, and he was one of the uh, most famous philosophers um, and he kind of invented or coined uh, the Socratic method, which we're going to get to. Uh, and themes present in modern science fiction have actually been present in other forms of literature that predate uh, what we consider to be modern science fiction. So there's some uh, Nordic tales of traveling to the moon that were written uh, way before uh, Frankenstein, which was the uh, first seminal work to which the label science fiction can be logically attached. It was published in 1818. Uh, so it was written on a dare, actually. Uh, so Humphrey Davy and uh, Mary Shelley kind of had a bet to see who could write the best piece of science fiction, uh, and they went into kind of a mansion for a weekend. And it explores what happens when we abandon our initially good creations. So Victor Frankenstein uh, was actually young, not a doctor, and perhaps a little naive uh, in, in the story. Uh, the monster was actually originally good, and then it was kind of released upon society after we didn't take care of it. So Frankenstein called for uh, innovative thinking and not new technology. And it kind of, the message was we need to better use and apply the technology that we have before we develop more. Um, so now we're gonna move into the policy relevance. Um, so President Bill Clinton read The Hot Zone, uh, and that's kind of a, a novel about a disease outbreak of, I believe, a weaponized version of Ebola that kind of gets loose throughout the world. Uh, and after that, uh, he allocated $300 million to prepare for a disease outbreak, and this included uh, stockpiling antibiotics, stepping up vaccine research, and training uh, state and local authorities to deal with a chemical or biological weapons attack. Um, but as reading science fiction and preparing for anything always the best way to approach problems? Um, I don't necessarily think so. Um, science fiction poses a lot of problems that may or may not be realistic. So Prey by Michael Crichton um, was written and it was written about uh, nanotechnology and essentially um, these little tiny, tiny nano robots were developed and they started wreaking havoc upon the world and doing a lot of uh, bad things. And as a result, Congress poured lots of money into nanotech research, safety, um, perhaps without sufficient reason because we haven't seen a lot of destructive nanotech uh, in recent years. So uh, an introduction to the project. Uh, this is uh, the article that I really pulled a lot from. It's called Why Today's Inventors Need to Read More Science Fiction. Um, so the paragraph, uh, MIT researchers Dan uh, Novi and Sophie Breckner argue that mind-bending mind worlds of authors such as Philip K. Dick and Arthur C. Clarke can help us not just come up with ideas for new gadgets, but to anticipate their consequences. So this is going back to that theme talk about, talking, talked about in Frankenstein, um, where it was saying, again, we need to uh, learn 
how we can uh, handle the technology that we have before we develop new ones. So, it establishes that we shouldn't neglect our technology. Uh, it establishes that science fiction has some value. Um, Sci-fi has inspired modern technologies and introduces the idea, or mentions the idea of uh, anticipation or anticipatory thinking. So just as Congress allocated about $300 million for biological and vaccine stuff uh, in preparation for an attack or anticipation of an attack, uh, we can do that for other things too. Um, and again, it mentions that we need to start teaching more ethics in STEM, but how? And that's what my project is gonna focus on. So the start uh, was at the Cohen Center for Technological Humanism. Uh, I was at kind of a brown bag lunch uh, with Dr. Connolly, a bunch of other grad students and professors, and we were talking about how uh, young people today have to sift through uh, massive quantities of information that other generations just haven't uh, had to do. And Dr. <coughs> Connolly mentioned that she was interested in teaching a class based off of science fiction. I approached her and said, I'd love to take the class. And she said, okay, well, how about you kind of do some research and you can help teach part of it. Um, so that's how the project officially started. Uh, and then I'd like to introduce to you to Zach Pertle, um, who is a program integration engineer at NASA and also comes from the same program uh, as Dr. Conley. Um, and he has contacted me, or we've gone back and forth throughout this project, and he's helped a little bit in the development. So he has a huge interest in science fiction. He views science fiction as a tool, and he has a reading group at NASA dedicated to sci-fi, which I think is pretty cool. So let's look at some technologies that uh, sci-fi has kind of anticipated. Uh, and I use that word a little bit loosely because I still want to uh, counter with the question, uh, did the authors have an accurate vision for the future of technology or did inventors read the science fiction and then develop the technology? So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, so some of science fiction's inspirations, okay, so a lot of this is from Star Trek. We've got the communicator that eventually became the cell phone. Uh, this is a 3D replicator that looks so astonishing like a 3D printer. Um, Google Glass inspirations right there, a uh, medical tricorder, which um, you kind of put up to someone and then you can read their vital signs. And we actually have, we have devices that you can pair with your smartphone that will do something like that. They'll measure pulse and external temperature. So that's actually happening. Uh, and then there was a book in the 1950s called Thomas Swift and His Electric Rifle, written uh, as a science fiction towards children. Uh, and again, it mentions electric rifles and it actually inspired uh, the TASER. So TASER stands for Thomas A. Swift and his electric rifle. So <laughs> that's where that comes from, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then Earthlight by Arthur C. Clarke, another 1950s novel, um, talks about, this is more of like a classic sci-fi with big spaceships and interplanetary wars. Um, he talked about using a magnetic accelerator to shoot pieces of metal uh, at other ships. Uh, and of course now in our Navy we have the railgun, which is that general atomics weapon um, right there, which uses the exact same principle. So uh, what does modern science fiction that's present today have to say about the future? Well, a lot of it is, this is Ex Machina, um, Westworld, a lot of it is dealing with artificial intelligence and humanoid androids. And then we have uh, Halo, that's actually Master Chief from a very popular video game series. He's kind of like a super soldier with all of the the latest technology, um, nearly invincible, all of that. Uh, and then we have Black Mirror, which I could probably lecture on each individual episode, and there's like three seasons out right now. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Um, it talks about uh, many, many different aspects about technological development, and it's very, very pessimistic about virtually every one of them. Um, so, uh, how likely are these things going to happen? Uh, well, are we going to have troops in space within 10 years? Um, we'll see. So over the summer uh, of 2016, I had the pleasure of studying under Major Jeff Matzler, who is in the U.S. Army. Uh, he's the U.S. Army's bioethicist and also uh, served in the arm armored division for 20 years. And he couldn't tell me that uh, we are going to have troops in space within 10 years, but he said that he was writing the ethics policies for if we were going to have troops in space uh, within 10 years. And we actually have a branch of the Army dedicated to uh, space. So the insignia on the right, that's the U.S. Army's um, Space and Missile Defense Center uh, insignia, which is actually a pretty well-funded branch now. And they're, they're talking about putting a, uh, a low, low Earth orbit base um, that can kind of hover or orbit the Earth for, uh, well, he didn't say why. Um, but, so moving on, uh, artificial intelligence that can rival the human mind. Well, we do have Watson, um, and, you know, I'm reading a lot that, uh, and I've talked to some uh, doctors that uh, computers are actually being able to diagnose people um, almost better than the doctors, and it's approaching and it's starting to surpass that even. Um, so that's just an example about how AI is really um, uh, developing. So uh, my point is that science fiction is relevant and that we can derive some useful information from it. 
so now we're going to go into some scholarly perspectives on technology and society. So there's two different categories of theories we're going to talk about. Uh, the first are deterministic approaches. So if you've ever heard, um, just wait, it'll be there. We'll have autonomous cars. There's nothing to do. There's nothing we can do to stop it. We're totally going to have the technology. That's a really deterministic approach. Uh, and it states that we have uh, very little control over technological development. Uh, and it's generally regarded as pessimistic because, again, we don't have a lot of control. Uh, and then we have the anticipatory approaches, which uh, state that we do have some control over technological development, and they're generally more optimistic. Uh, so going into a deterministic social theory, um, we have technological determinism, so, and that states that the development of technology drives social and cultural changes. So this is kind of what I'm trying to attack a little bit, um, but we'll move on to the next one, which is law lag, and that is the theory that the development of technology is outpacing the development of laws, policies, and social codes to regulate it, and some theorists assert that technology is outpacing us at an increasing rate. So on the right, we have Usain Bolt uh, representing the development of new technology. On the left, we have policymakers that are desperately trying to catch up with it uh, and uh, try and regulate it in any capacity. And uh, many people believe that uh, the gap in between them is actually getting larger and larger. So moving to the more optimistic uh, anticipatory social theories, we have, we have uh, anticipatory governance. So that's the theory that society has the capacity to think about the development of technology and make decisions about it before we have to. So that's kind of what, Frank, what um, the theme of Frankenstein was advocating for. Uh, then we have midstream modulation developed by Eric Fisher. Um, and it states that uh, tech designers, uh, which are like this overlooked uh, midstream of technological development uh, should have a bigger role in shaping the governance of new and emerging technology. So the timeline on the bottom, we have um, the technological developmental timeline, which basically states that um, there's the first one, which is researching the technology and the policy implementations. Then we actually have uh, researching the physical technology and trying to develop it. And then we have uh, regulations and policy. So Eric Fisher is trying to make the case that the midstream, or the scientists in the lab, can have a say both forwards and backwards in the development of the technology. So it seeks to alter this linear developmental timeline uh, of technology through debate and public exposure. And I think that science fiction can be used as a tool within this midstream space. Um, so now we're going to transition into the value in teaching. Uh, so, after reading a small piece of science fiction, I think that academic papers on uh, science, technology, and society theories that we kind of just talked about earlier, um, they become more palatable to students who may not have ever been exposed to those sort of theories before. Uh, and I think that science fiction can be used as a brainstorming tool to think about the problems that new technology may bring before they actually happen. So, you can write about a number of different scenarios and kind of explore and think how possible are these and sort through. Uh, which ones may need uh, a little bit more exploration. So, um, in terms of science fiction being used today in academia, it actually is. Um, so the Kansas University Gun Center for the Study of Science Fiction, uh, we have the MIT Media Lab and the Center for Science and Imagination uh, at ASU. So, um, let's see, there we go. So I'm interested in expanding upon uh, this work that's already there and investigating and expanding the midstream as the STEM classroom as a space for building a capacity for anticipating the future. Uh, so let's move into the actual capstone project, which has been going on for the last three years. Uh, so we found that science fiction uh, does have themes found in academia. Um, and once that happened, we began a very large literature review. So I spent the summer of 2015 uh, reading and writing about science fiction and kind of cataloging what I thought was valuable, where we could find academic themes in them. Um, and I also reviewed teaching styles and case studies of science fiction being used in the classroom, kind of documented how those went. So in the uh, summer of 2016, uh, I was able to attend the Sherwin B. Newland Summer Institute for Bioethics, and that's where I really explored uh, more bioethics and ethics, uh, because I wanted to be able to uh, actually teach that, which uh, I think it worked out very well. Uh, and then we had classroom preparation to teach a module of ISAT 231, which is our um, social context class with technology. And uh, we did this after a pilot lesson in ISAT 113, which is a virus research lab. So um, I considered a few different models of teaching. Uh, the first category is going to be the passive or traditional model. We'll call it the banking model or the sage on the stage model. Uh, and as you can see in the picture, the professor or teacher is just kind of depositing knowledge into the students' heads. Um, so that is the more traditional approach to teaching. 
Uh, and then the alternative, or more modern, is the active model. Um, so like facilitated discussion or problem posing where the professor uh, goes to the students and says, here's a problem, how about you guys talk about it and try and find a solution? Uh, or the moral case deliberation where the professor would say, what's more ethical, you guys talk about it and you debate. Um, so the teacher is really used as a guide and not this depositor of information like in the banking model. Uh, and it stems from the Platonic dialogues or the Socratic method, uh, which uh, again we mentioned Socrates a little bit before. So uh, I decided upon the active model. Um, I think that teaching ethics specifically benefits from the active model. So just as math requires you to do uh, practice problems, uh, ethics requires deliberation. So with math, you may be able to, you may get the wrong answer at the end of the problem, but you can still award a lot of partial credit for the, um, for the process there. And that's a lot of what ethics is about, is the process and accurate deliberation. Um, so using this, uh, a pilot lesson was given using blood music by Greg Bear as a way to demonstrate the academic concepts and value of science fiction. Uh, so again, we use the active model and the students were very receptive. But before I go on, um, there are some arguments for the passive model. Um, I do think it's a valuable approach um, personally, it's, I think it's very hard to critically think your way through answering problems involving uh, like what happened or what is happening questions. So like history, for example, is, is a hard one to do with the active model. So Blood Music. Uh, this is a short story written by Greg Bear, who actually approves of the project. I was able to get in touch with him, and he got back with me and said that he was really excited about it. So I'm going to probably send him my slides after this. Uh, it's going to be cool. So. Uh, the students read the short story and then came to class and we discussed the events of the short story. Um, in short, there was a scientist who developed these uh, very like smart cells. He was ordered to destroy all of them uh, and he was fired from the company. Instead, he injected himself with them and then left the lab. Um, and after that, it started making changes to his body, uh, like his teeth got straighter, his eyesight got better, uh, and he talked to a doctor about it. The doctor did nothing. And then um, the cells didn't have his best interest in mind because they ended up killing him and trying to spread. And it was just a big catastrophe. So we identified moments where different decisions could have been made to prevent the catastrophe in the story. So maybe not developing the technology, maybe not injecting yourself, maybe not leaving the lab after you inject yourself. Maybe the doctor could have also told someone about that. Um, there are a bunch of different things. So then I introduced the uh, ice minus bacteria case study, which is very similar to blood music, minus the catastrophe. So the first case, <laughs> the first case of um, a, genet a genetically modified organism ever being released into the environment is when a uh, bacteria called Pseudomonas syringae, I believe I'm so happy I got that right, um, it was genetically modified to uh, prevent the development of frost on strawberries. So you spray the strawberries with bacteria, um, they can survive lower temperatures and you get better crops. So the scientists sprayed that literally on some strawberries out on the roof of their lab um, and they got released into the environment um, and no one ever really would have known about that if it wasn't for a disgruntled employee who was recently fired and went and told the media. Um, so there are a number of uh, things that happen a little bit differently with that. Um, the biggest being someone went to the media and said, hey, this happened. Um, and as a result, um, the scientists were moved out into the middle of nowhere to do their research. But um, there was no catastrophe, which is good. And I'd like to add that just because a genetically modified bacteria got released, there probably wouldn't have been a catastrophe anyway. So students discussed the uh, similarities and common themes. So uh, let's go back and we'll relate it to why today's inventors uh, needed to read more science fiction. Maybe they could have started thinking about the implications of the bacteria exiting the lab or why this could be ethically questionable before they actually did it. So uh, this leads me to the actual teaching module. Um, this is ISAT 231. Uh, I mentioned it was a social context class earlier. It's actually called uh, Politi Political Economy of Technology and Science. So uh, I did an initial warm-up activity or concept map with the students. Um, I introduced the trolley problem, which if anyone studied philosophy, um, they've probably heard of this. It's where um, it's a thought experiment where you have a train heading towards four people that are tied down on a track, and you, this bystander has the option of pulling the lever, and it diverts the train to uh, kill someone else, but only one person. So does that person have the obligation or ethical permission to pull the lever? So that's the thought experiment. And there's a bunch of different variations, including just pushing someone in front of the train, and how is that different than the first scenario? So they really enjoyed that. Um, and then I started introducing the project, um, more classic ethics and bioethics. And I, tol I told them about um, actual tools that are used in bioethics today. So we have uh, autonomy, respect what the patient wants, uh, beneficence, do good things, 
non-maleficence, don't do bad things, and justice, which refers to a lot of things, but mainly distribution of scarce resources. So then I used Gattaca, which is a movie about uh, a future, if we could choose uh, all of the traits in our kids, essentially. Um, and I introduced it with a few case studies derived from that movie, such as uh, sex selection. So is it ethical to choose the sex of your child or um, using a procedure, essentially fertilize roughly 30 embryos and then choose the ones um, that you want? So is it okay to do this based off of their sex? In Scotland, uh, you can't do that. Um, but what about the deaf child case study where this actually happened, a deaf couple was living in a deaf community and wanted to select for a child with deafness. Uh, it is not illegal to do that in America, uh, and that procedure did happen. So uh, after that we discussed science fiction and uh, Brave New World, uh, which kind of has some commentary just on that, and then related back to Frankenstein. And then we went through the blood music lesson again, which I thought was uh, really nice. Uh, and then we did some more uh, wrap-up worksheets. That's what they looked like. Um, they're essentially concept maps uh, where you have a number of stocks and relationships and things, and it's um, an exercise in critical thinking. So uh, a reflection, uh, I think that the students were very involved, and it was great, um, but it left uh, less time for activities and concept maps that I wanted to be a little bit more comprehensive. Um, but it was really nice because uh, students were so engaged that they requested an additional module um, be attached. Uh, so I ended up teaching two days for two classes instead of just one, so that was really nice. So concluding thoughts. Uh, I think I've demonstrated that science fiction can be used in education. Uh, it's easily accessible. It contains themes found in academia and points towards anticipatory thinking. Um, it's a brainstorming tool for what could happen with our technology and it's compatible with established teaching methods. Uh, also, science fiction is becoming more and more popular uh, with the new Star Trek, uh, Westworld, and Black Mirror being very popular. So I'd just like to say thank you to, for Dr. Conley, to Dr. Conley, uh, for sticking with this project for three whole years. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit longer than most other projects. Uh, Dr. Temple, who I don't think is here right now, um, she let me uh, kind of use her lab for the blood music pilot study. Uh, Dr. York for actually helping me develop this presentation. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Dritter Vignone put me in touch with Dr. Connolly in the first place, and then uh, Zach Pertle, who is over at NASA. And also uh, the ISAT 113 and 231 students. So, thank you. Uh, I think we have some time for questions, I hope. Okay, awesome. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so your presentation, and this is a, a tangential to my field, but kind of outside, so sorry okay. if I'm going to ask you a question. No, you're fine. Yes. Um, it seems to put a lot of power in the hands of the author, and mm -hmm. I was wondering what your thoughts were on the obligations of the author and the way they present the technology, knowing that it's so powerful in the way that we're driving mm -hmm. technological advancement. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it definitely does give the author a lot of power to sway public opinion on yeah. things. Um, right. And I think that's where we have to kind of resort back to um, like what is established as good science fiction or what proves itself to be good science fiction. So like the Hugo Awards are um, uh, essentially a, an award system where everyone can, or a bunch of people or authors can submit their works. Um, and I would hopefully think that the more realistic or more valuable pieces of science fiction um, are the ones that kind of actually do get the awards. Um, but, but not necessarily the ones that aren't being really heavily read, right? Especially by yeah. non-STEM people. So yeah. do you think it's, it's an obligation of the author to think through the power of that work? Or do you think the author has mm -hmm. just full autonomy, they can write whatever they want, they can push their own agenda? Hmm. Or do they have ethical obligations? You can okay. think about that, we can talk about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that one's, that's really cool. Like, it, it honestly depends on um, the author's intentions in a way. So if they're trying to shape or uh, to shape public opinion, maybe they should probably do it well or accurately. Um, but if they're trying to just make a science fiction piece for their own uh, enjoyment, then yeah. Um, now that doesn't consider the actual implications of the work being released. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, Scott. Did you in the class talk about or discuss the idea where like when someone releases a work, mm -hmm. it may not be their purpose for what it ends up being interpreted, like for example, The Jungle, where it was released <laughs> to be a commentary on how worker conditions were. It turned out everyone read it and was like, oh my gosh, my food's gross. So. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we actually didn't go into 
the kind of meta analysis of science yeah. fiction. I tried to keep it as um, informative in terms of ethical theories mm -hmm. because that was the the lesson was bioethics and ethics. Yeah. Um, but that would probably be very suited for a literature class that uses science fiction rather than okay. a um, science, technology, and society class that also uses science fiction. Yeah. Uh, one more. I'm just wondering, um, you said it can, science fiction can be a useful tool in educating people. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody who suggests that it can't be? I mean, obviously taking away literature, which I mean, I don't think anybody would argue, mm -hmm. but is there anybody saying no, science fiction isn't, isn't a legitimate way to teach, or is your project more about here's how it can be used? It's, um, a lot of it is the how perspective, and I think that um, I was coming from a place of thinking that maybe science fiction doesn't have the best uh, rap when it comes to uh, its credibility. It's not really seen as highbrow, and oh, that God. was the thing that I wanted to kind of say that it could be. Great. Uh, all right, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it.